It's nice to be back. Thank you very much, Chetuan. Uh, this is the third time that I've had the pleasure of speaking here. Uh, I lived in India for 40 years. I lived in India for 10 years. I came to India 40 years ago. I, I'm not old enough to have lived here 40 years, but I wish I had. Uh, maybe I'll be lucky enough to come back in another lifetime and live here for 40 yep. years. I, I love being here, and I'm just thrilled to be back. Um, the last two times that I was here, I spoke about uh, pandemics, and I spoke about climate change. Today I'm going to speak about something which is a, a bigger issue that contains within it many of the aspects of climate change, pandemics, water, nuclear weapons, regional conflicts. Uh, we call it uh, the Skoll Global Threats Fund. The Skoll Global Threats Fund was started by Jeff Skoll. Uh, Jeff was the uh, co-founder of eBay. And uh, after he had uh, been very successful in the corporate world, he decided that he would like to live out his childhood ambition of trying to use his resources and his success to work on those nightmarish things that could bring humanity to its knees. And he articulated five global threats. Climate change, water security, pandemics, nuclear proliferation, and in his mind, the Middle East. Now, he could have added economic collapse. He could have added food insecurity. But there's something about modernity and the world that we live in. I think Tom Friedman spoke today about the hyper-connected world. There's something about the world that we live in in this particular moment that we find ourselves at this time and this place where these systemic changes put at risk the nature of the civilization that we've inherited and that we had hoped to bequeath to our children. Um, there's something in common that each of these things have. Of course, it's preposterous to have an organization that purports to deal with all of these threats. I mean, goodness, a hundred organizations could uh, spend all of their time and resources on any one of them. But what makes us a little bit different is that we're trying to find the themes beneath these, uh, the working on which will have a good effect on all of them. Working on global governance, for example, communications, leadership, going beyond the specifics of the threats. And we're, we're fortunate also in that we're part of a family of organizations started by Jeff. Um, he owns a company called Participant Media, which makes films and has recently bought a television channel with 50 million homes. You've seen some of the movies, Contagion, Inconvenient Truth, Last Call at the Oasis. I don't know, have any of you seen Best Exotic Marigold Hotel or Lincoln, The Help? Uh, these are all movies that uh, spark your imagination on how you can go out and do something good. They're, they're not uh, usual Hollywood fare. And uh, we're really fortunate to be able to work on some of these movies and work with our sister organization participant. Our other sister organization is the Skoll Foundation, which works to bring to life the concept of social entrepreneurship. And so far, has funded uh, over 90 social entrepreneurs. Uh, more than a dozen of them are from South Asia. Uh, Jeff also has an organization which is an uh, investment company that makes for-profit investments alongside of the organizational work that's done by the movie company and by the foundations. So we're part of this organization, well, family, and we work together. Now, I first came to India uh, because of the 1970 Bola cyclone. Um, I had finished uh, doing a movie for Warner Brothers. I was a doctor, a rock doc, working on a movie about rock and roll. And we saw the films of the Bola cyclone and a group of us, having finished this uh, film with a Pink Floyd concert in Canterbury, decided that we would try to raise funds and uh, come across Asia, drive, from Canterbury to, uh, to Bola Island. 
and we collected goods and we collected money and we, we set off on a journey. Um, by the time we got to India, uh, East Pakistan no longer existed and it wasn't possible for us to go to Bola Island. Um, so we turned left and we went to Nepal and I wound up staying here for 10 years. So, but Bola Island always had a particularly important place in my life. Uh, the cyclone was devastating. If we think now about extreme weather, perhaps there is no more extreme weather than that Bola cyclone. Whether it was 300,000 who died or a million who died, there are so many different reports. It's an unknowable number, but it's a huge number. And it was just the beginning of a series of catastrophic extreme events all over the world. My next encounter with Bola Island was that uh, as a young fellow, uh, my first real job other than rock and roll, was to work for the World Health Organization in the smallpox eradication program. And I worked on that for 10 years, culminating with the last case of killer smallpox who happened to be on Bola Island, a young girl named Rahima Banu. We made over a billion house calls. We had 150,000 people working on that program. It's a tribute to what India can do that she was able to eradicate smallpox while in the midst of so many other crises. But when that young girl coughed her last disease and the viruses fell on the heat-filled, sun-drenched fields in Bola Island, a virus died that was an unending chain of transmission going back to Pharaoh Ramses V. And so Bola Island became again a part of my life. And the third time that I encountered Bola Island, of course, is in what has happened to Bola as a consequence of climate change. And, and that's really what I'm going to spend the rest of my talk on, is the effect of climate change on water, the effect of water on Bola Island, and the ecology. I'm going to try to describe almost a horseshoe-shaped uh, series of watersheds with Bola Island on one side, the Pakistani floods on another, and the Himalayas at the top, sometimes even thought of as the third pole and try to put them all together, talking about a regional problem that could indeed become a global threat very easily. It has been called ground zero of climate change. Rising sea levels and melting glaciers in the Himalayas have already destroyed half of the 6,000 square kilometer island over the past 40 years. Experts predict in the next 20 years, the whole island will have been erased. So Bola Island is the canary in the coal mine to mix a bunch of metaphors. It is the place that is at the bottom uh, of the, the water totem pole. It's downstream of the Himalayas. It's downstream of the Ganges, downstream of the Brahmaputra. But not only is it downstream, and therefore is it most sensitive to the effects of the melting Himalayas, it is also simultaneously affected by rising sea level. So as sea levels rise and the Himalayas melt more, Bola is attacked from both ends. And let's take a look at that and see if we can't get an idea of the relationship between climate change and water and the fate of these areas that are downstream. Uh, so Bola Island uh, is I don't know if you, oh, okay. You can see it over there, good. Um, Bola Island is down on, on to my right and the Pakistani flood's down to the left. And let's try to animate that and see if we can get a better idea. This is sort of these two great watersheds, the Indus and the, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra. And we're gonna try to take a tour. We're gonna start with Bola, we're gonna go north, we're gonna go through the Brahmaputra, we're gonna go through the Padma and the Ganges, up to the Kali Gandaki, go up to Nepal, take a look at the melting of the Himalayas and some of the deforestation. Then we're going to go down the other arm of that channel and see if we can't learn something from exploring these relationships. First, of course, you see how water is affecting Bola. And I can no longer go back to Rahima Banu's house, a place that should be the most inspirational place in South Asia for an epidemiologist like me. I can't go back there anymore because it's underwater, as much of Bola Island is. Let's pull out for just a second. Let's ask the question 
of what would happen if sea levels rise by one meter or if there is a storm surge and they rise by 20 meters and you can see the amount of devastation. Almost all of Bangladesh would be in fact inundated and destroyed and because it's salt water it's like Rome sacking Carthage and salting the land never to grow food again. Now let's just navigate ourselves up. We'll go to the Padma, to the Ganges, go up to the Himalayas. I think I skipped a little bit there. And in the, uh, in the Trai of Nepal, I don't know if you know that Nepal is really kind of divided into three parallelograms. There's the Trai, the flat area, the mid hills, and then the high Himalayas. And until 40 years ago, the Terai was uninhabited except by a few uh, tribes whose uh, genetic changes had adapted them to malaria. No one else lived in the Terai because of the intensity of falciparum malaria that was there. With the success of the malaria eradication program though, the Terai became habitable and Indians moved up, Nepalis moved down, and agricultural development began. And what's the first thing that you do if you're starting an agricultural communities, you cut down all the trees. And so you're seeing again the relationship between humans and vectors and land and disease. And we call this One Health, a movement which is trying to put all of this in context. Um, so we'll go up, we'll take a look at the melting of the Himalayas. Now you can kind of think the Himalayas melt, the trees which used to act like straws sucking up the excess effluent that would come down seasonally, those trees are gone, more water comes down at times that are unanticipated, the seas rise, and this entire very carefully uh, organized ecological system that people have grown accustomed to over millennia and adapted to is so terribly disrupted. And we haven't even started talking about the waterworks, the dams, the barrages, the canals that have been added to it. All right, now let's reverse course. Now let's go down and look at the Indus River, coming back from the Himalayas. We'll come down. Again, we have melting Himalayas. The water rushes down. Huge amounts of water come down in Pakistan. There's confusion. We had the, the flooding of 2010, close to 2,000 people killed, 20 million people affected, a fifth of Pakistan's total land area underwater. So I just wanted to begin a conversation, and I know Jeff's going to pick it up. The conversation is, we have changes in the region. Many of these changes come from climate change. Some of them are mediated through water, others through land use, others through population changes, some through disease. We have to think about global governance, regional governance. We have to ask ourselves, what do we do in the face of these changes and in the face of these global threats that challenge the life that we have always felt we inherited and that we want to bequeath to our children. And uh, on behalf of the Skoll community, I want to ask you how we can help, how we can work together, what ideas you have, and I, over the next couple of days, I hope that I get a chance to hear from you and we carry on this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brilliant. I'd just like to add two words which I, uh, for the benefit particularly of those uh, who wouldn't be familiar with Hindi as a language, uh, just to translate, and perhaps it's just ironical, that uh, Bhola in, in Hindi means uh, innocent. Yeah. Huh. And uh, well, to see that innocent lives are lost, perhaps it's just uh, representative. And the second thing, I was trying to wonder why would uh, a brilliant professor choose to rock the boat from a career in rock and roll and move to something so grave? And the only thing I was trying to think of perhaps is that if you look at music, music is something that transcends all cultures, all barriers, all people, caste, creed, color, and so does tragedy. And maybe there is in some ways, a subtle uh, commonality between both. We'd like to uh, now take questions from the house, and I request uh, Professor Sachs to be a little patient before his speech. Would you like to uh, ask uh, 
Dr. Brilliant, any question? Since he's asked for ideas, I'm sure uh, somebody will have some great ideas to provide him. We'd like to ensure that uh, he goes back a satisfied man, at least with some ideas. Yes. Sir, uh, could we have the mic, please, the gentleman standing in front? Very quickly, please. Thank you for the speed. Thank you, uh, Professor Brilliant. Uh, I am from Bangladesh, and Bola is in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So you, I remember that uh, when the Bola incidents uh, happened, at that time I was an eight years young boy, now I have gray hair. So uh, that actually a devastating uh, sort of thing. But we also face a similar sort of thing very recently in 2008 and 2009 which we call the Isla and the Sidor affected and more than 5,000 people were killed. And now, almost more than 20 million people live in the coastal area in Bangladesh. And only in Bola, the population is more than 2 million. Yeah. And the Bola is within the one meter of sea level. So if there is a, the, the, Consequential effect of this climate change, we are really Bangladesh in vulnerable state. If you compare with the population, then we are much uh, uh, exposed to the vulnerability than the, than the <coughs> island state even. Island state, of course, they are in more vulnerable state, but in such their such population size is much lesser than the, than the population who live in the coastal area. So my question is that a lot of talkings are going on for the last 20 years. When it will come to the realization to the world leader and also the policy makers and decision makers that this is the time, this is the last time to do something for the betterment of the people, those who are really exposed to the, to the, to the, to the climate change. So, so I, uh, because Global Threats is the middle name of the organization that I run, we, we tend to look at things um, through the lens of global threats. And if, uh, if this family of Rahima Banu, one example of a family who've lost their house and have become migrants, they've become really climate refugees. And th they're not the only ones. There have been hundreds of thousands of climate refugees all throughout Bangladesh just because of the phenomenon that you described. And that 100,000, that one lakh or two lakh of climate refugees is just the beginning. It's a trickle that will become a flood. And estimates are that there could be as many as 100 million climate refugees leaving Bangladesh, going into Burma, going into Assam, going into Meghalaya, going into India, going into Bengal. That becomes a global threat. And so it, it, if you you know, one hates to do this, but you have to wrap your mind around what happens with these incremental changes in climate that create the circumstances, in this case, refugees, that could bring down the economic system, the system of regional governance, the relationship, the trans-border relationships. And that's what I'm most keenly concerned about right now as I, as I look at it. And thank you very much for your comments. Yes. Could you speak into the mic? Could you speak into the mic, please? Thank you. Yeah, my name is Madhav Karki. I used to be the Deputy Director General of EC Mode, and now I'm, uh, Sorry. I'm working for another organization called the Institute of no, Social no and problem. Economic Transition in Just, Nepal. No problem. Uh, I compliment you for a very nice talk. My question uh, to you is, uh, you have you know, talked about global threat, but uh, global threat actually builds on, uh, I would say, bottom-up means there are many uh, mini threats. So you talked of Nepal, I come from Nepal. Uh, while you talk of you know, alarming situation that there is deforestation and of course sea level rise, but uh, climate change I think it also brings opportunities. One of, you, one of that you alluded to is uh, you know, countries could cooperate together. The another one is when we are talking here, communities are already adapting. They are already trying to cope with the situation. So my question to you is, you were asking for ideas. 
is your foundation ready to uh, to support all these community-based initiative and Nepal uh, community forestry is one of the globally successful community-based natural resource management and that will build the resilience uh, to the systems and uh, and I think your concept of uh, reducing global threat uh, will have to address the poverty and climate change, the twin challenges which Ban Ki-moon has said are the defining challenges of the 20th century. So how can you uh, support, there are thousands of small, small initiatives which are uh, successful to scale up uh, and really create the impact. Thank you very much. Do you want me to do? Um, I just got off the plane from uh, Bangkok uh, a few hours ago and I was I was there for the uh, Prince Mahadal Award ceremony, and um, when we spoke about global threats, I had several questions such as yours, which is, aren't these the sensationalistic threats? These are the you know, mass extinction events. We could be talking about dinosaurs dying and meteor, meteors coming, and uh, you have Hollywood movies, and it, it, you know, there, there is always the risk that when you focus on these big things, you lose you lose sight of the fact that the only thing that matters are people. And that, I mean, the things that I think Jeff is going to talk about, the rising inequality of income distribution, S systemically, these are far more important in the aggregate than any of the, the threats that we're talking about. Our sister organization, the Skoll Foundation, funds almost exclusively in this area. And we've kind of divided up the, the areas that we do. Otherwise, I would not feel uh, I could talk about these issues, uh, it, it's, it's very funny, there's a poem, I'll, 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 I'll try it. During the Second World War, uh, Bertolt Brecht uh, was asked about uh, what were the greatest moral threats of the time, and he, he was talked to by a bunch of environmentalists, and they, they talked to him about reforestation, and he said, what kind of an age is it when to talk about trees is almost a sin because of the sins it leaves unspoken? How can we talk about global threats and leave unspoken the plight of the poor and the, the inequality that we're seeing, which itself is a global threat? 